Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which as usual has popped up the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, we're having an amazing day. We have a ton of stuff to get through uh, in this video with AMD's Ryzen 4000 series and tons of stuff for NVIDIA's upcoming Ampere GPUs, including a couple of unreleased SKUs. I've also done a second video today, which is focused on tons of announcements for the Xbox Series X and S. So if you're interested in console stuff, you can check that video out. As a quick note, if you can hear any background road repairs, I apologize. I will do my best to nuke that uh, post-production, but it just is what it is. Um, and goodness knows what time they're going to finish, and there's so much news at the moment. I've got a couple of other projects that I want to be doing. I'm actually testing an older card at the moment. It's kind of like uh, a fun project, so there's like an R9 290X uh, currently in the 10900K system, so we're going to be testing that out on the channel just for fun. It's just literally for fun. I want to test out some old GPUs as we get ready for Ampere Madness over the next couple of months, as well as RDNA 2 Madness, of course. Anyway, getting back to the bloody point, let's talk about Ryzen 4000. We've discussed one billion times, probably one trillion, actually, of the IPC gains, clock frequency gains, improvements to the cache system, you know, blah, 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 for the next generation Ryzen. But if you've been watching the channel for any time, you'll know that I've mentioned several times at this point that I heard that there were improvements to how the boost was handled for the next generation. I didn't have any specifics, just that I got told that the CPU seems to be better at maintaining higher clock frequencies, and there seems to be less drop-off or something with more cores loaded. Again, I didn't have any specifics, but that's what I was told. Um, and I actually even mentioned this in yesterday's video, and it's actually great timing, because... Yuri, who is the creator of Ryzen Optimizer, has actually uh, provided some insight into this. So let's read. According to Yuri, one of the key features of Zen 3 will be the uh, Curve Optimizer. This allows you to configure the boost of the Ryzen processors. In addition, you will be able to customize the frequency of each core without restriction. I'm sure you can imagine how this could improve gaming performance. Now... I want to give you the killer blow, and that is that there's going to be a 10-core skew. Um, yeah. This one surprised me. From everything I'd heard, there were going to be exactly the same core counts as what we saw from the previous generation. And that's true, only AMD are doing a sneaky, they're pulling a sneaky on us, and they're also releasing a 10-core processor. I'm sure this has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that it would compete perfectly core count-wise to the 10900K. I'm sure that that is complete coinkydink. But being serious for a moment, this skew could actually be really interesting, not just from a you know comp uh, competing against Intel perspective, but if it's real, and again, I can't verify this information, it makes a lot of sense from the perspective of possibly cherry-picking samples to have higher clock frequencies. In yesterday's video, uh, we covered the fact that um, the 12-core SKUs were allegedly hitting 4.9 gigahertz, which, as we all know, AMD tends to cherry-pick the best quality sil uh, silicon for the highest core count parts, which, of course, would be the 16-core parts uh, for the Ryzen uh, 3000 series. So we can assume that there is at least some chance that we could hit... 5 gigahertz for the 4950X. Of course, it's not guaranteed, but maybe with overclocking, and if the stars and the moon align just right, maybe it will hit it. But if I were AMD, and obviously I'm not AMD, but if I were AMD, I would be in the mindset of, oh, okay, well, you want to have a 10-core processor, eh? Okay, cool, I'm going to hit 5 gigahertz on that. And I would try to have a 5 gigahertz 10 core part because it would compete exactly perfectly to take on Intel. There are definitely challenges with this because then you're essentially somewhat cherry picking silicon, which might be better served on other parts. Um, although, of course, you could theoretically have, because obviously it's going to be a 5 slash 5 part, so. Maybe in that respect. So it definitely has some challenges. I don't know what the yields are for the Zen 3 architecture. I don't know how good 
uh, the quality of silicon is. You assume it's going to be decent. Although, of course, the very best silicon, the very, very bestest, that always goes to servers. Because clearly they want um, not just, it's not just because of clock frequency, but they also need to run, you know, without it pulling the equivalent of a nuclear power plant's worth of energy. So the very bestest silicon generally goes to that. But I still think there's, this is not confirmation, this is purely a guess, but if I were AMD, I would at least be tempted to have a 5 gigahertz uh, 10 core part. You could also theoretically maybe do it anyway because of lower power consumption and heat than a 12 core part. Again, I say that with a lot of ignorance of how AMD are bending their SKUs and how AMD plan to market this stuff, so I could be wrong. For all I know, the 10 core part could run at like 2 gigahertz. Obviously, that's just being silly, but you get my point. It's going to be very interesting to see how AMD market that because, again, they could also drastically undercut Intel by a hefty price. The only issue with undercutting Intel is do they have to? I mean, is that that's a legit question, I feel. Do they have to undercut Intel? Because it's like, let's assume that IPC-wise, AMD are slightly, slightly, slightly ahead, but because of clock frequency, Intel are slightly ahead when it comes to games. Not by much, let's just say a few percent, but... You've got more cores, you've got obviously PCIe 4, blah, blah, blah. Would you really want to cut the price drastically below what Intel are charging? I don't know. I mean, hmm. It's an interesting, it's an interesting quandary, isn't it? And also, I'm going to throw in a tiny, tiny bit of bonus information in this video. Full credit to Moore's Law is dead on this, by the way. Um, this is according to what he's told me in DM. He gave me full permission to share this. Uh, he and I talk kind of frequently. I also speak to Jim quite a bit as well on uh, Twitter. It's, it's kind of fun. Um, but uh, more so is dead. Tom did tell me, and again, he's given me full permission to share this, that from what he's heard from a new source, I cannot verify this information. This is about RDNA 3. According to what he's heard, the CU, or some of the functionality on the RDNA 3 architecture, allegedly runs independently. So he's unsure whether this is, um, well, Rob, I'm unsure whether this would mean it's just on a CU basis. So let's say CU1 can run at slightly different clock speeds to CU5. I'm just throwing numbers out. Or whether this is also going to be what I explained in one of my PlayStation 5 videos, I think it was the PS5 uh, APU Bring Up, uh, where I called the uh, PS5 an enhanced version of RDNA 2, which is basically a custom design for Sony. Uh, Microsoft have obviously customized the Xbox to, uh, to a degree as well. But one of the things I got told was that the RT functions seem to run more independently than RDNA uh, 2 does. So I got told it's almost like a, a separate clock frequency or something, but my source didn't give me enough information to 100% call how it functioned. So I wonder if that's similar for RDNA 3. Honestly, I don't know. It kind of sounds like Sony did something different to what uh, Tom is explaining here for RDNA 3, and that's if, A, the information from Tom is legit, obviously. I'm not questioning his, uh, his honesty. I'm questioning whether, obviously, his source is being accurate. Again, I'm not throwing him under the bus. I just, you know, I, I can't verify it. And he's obviously not going to tell me where that source works or what have you for obvious uh, reasons. And obviously, assuming my information for the PlayStation 5 are having independent clock frequencies um, as well, that was from a different source. It's not one of my regular ones. But even so, hmm. Uh, but anyway, let's get away from AMD. I think we've discussed them quite a bit now and move over to NVIDIA. I think it's fair to say that uh, Ampere is going to be a very interesting launch. Um, obviously, we know about three SKUs so far. We know about the 30, 70, 80, and finally 90. Well, obviously, 90 being way more expensive. It's essentially the uh, Titan replacement. But we do know, too, that there are multiple GPUs which will fill out the product stack. And what I'd like to discuss, first of all, is the 3060. And this actually is courtesy of Copy 7 Kimmy. This is a very notable leak because he was very accurate with a plethora of things for uh, the Ampere architecture previously. 
So again, I can't verify this, but um, I think A, we can be certain that there's going to be a 3060 variant or variants of 3060, and B, the specs look kind of accurate to what I would expect from an alleged 3060. So the 3060 Ti or Super, we don't have specs of the base uh, cards at the moment, is allegedly going to feature 8GB of memory, um, which again makes sense given the class of card that we're discussing and also of course the year that we're in. And it will feature 4,864 shaders. This is 1,024 shaders lower than the RTX 3070. Now, of course, with the Ampere architecture, uh, NVIDIA have doubled the number of uh, FP32 units per SM, so you can you know, easily do the conversions yourself. But long story short, this still theoretically means that the 3060 Ti could be absolute, or I'm just going to call it the, the Ti, it could be the Super, it could be, you know, Papa's Lunch for all we know, but that GPU theoretically could be an absolute monster. I don't think it's going to be enough for 4K by any stretch of the imagination. Well, I guess it could be if you're running like DLSS, but um, I think for 1440p, uh, on a four, 120 hertz, something like that, it could be a really nice card. Um, my guess is, though, that this card is going to be really comfortable um, as a card which is going to absolutely... This is obviously going out on a limb, but I think it's going to be easily one of the most popular cards in NVIDIA's lineup. Um, this card is going to easily outperform pretty much all of the Pascal lineup. Obviously, as well, it's got things like hardware-based ray tracing. So you could easily, with DLSS2, run something at 1080p, upsample it to 1440p, get insane frames a second. And I don't think this card is obviously going to be able to outperform an RTX 2080 Ti. That's just not realistic. But something like a 26, sorry, a 2080, 2080 Super, around there, that would make sense. Uh, which means that it's probably about on par to a 1080 Ti. Again, that's a guess. And of course, all of this stuff as well would depend upon the game. I suspect that uh, titles in a year or two, when we start to see mesh shading or whatever become kind of more prevalent in games, then there's probably going to be a more drastic speed up. But either way, I think that this card is going to be super popular with folks. Uh, it's all going to come down to the pricing, naturally. But we also have some other leaks too, and I'd like to thank Avery on uh, Twitter for actually tagging me into uh, this uh, discussion. Uh, so full credit to him. Uh, this is actually from allegedly a colourful representative. Now, they essentially have leaked several upcoming cards. So assuming that their information is accurate, this is very interesting. Uh, according to this information, we have an RTX 3080 Super, which is 20 gigabytes, and there's going to be a 3070 Super 2. Uh, that's going to be a 16 gigabyte card, so essentially double the capacity we have with the base GPUs. Those will launch in October. It's going to be the 14th of October, so uh, just over a month from as of the time I'm recording this. And the 3060 will launch on the 24th. Again, that will also be October. As of the time I'm recording this video, there is no confirmed prices for these GPUs. Um, I think that uh, it's going to be super interesting. From what I understand, the Xbox Series X... Uh, essentially forced NVIDIA's hand. Um, this is one of the things that I've been told through the grapevine with uh, with my recent AMD leaks as well. I got told that NVIDIA's hand were basically forced with the Xbox Series X. So theoretically speaking, um, I imagine that uh, it's going to be kind of a case of not just needing to compete with AMD. It's going to be a case of needing to compete with the console manufacturers as well. And we know that the consoles are going to launch at uh, some point in November. That's been leaked like two trillion times at this point. So I will be super curious to see what the marketing strategy is for both of these companies. With NVIDIA, it's obviously going to be DLSS, DLSS, RTX, RTX, DLSS, DLSS, RTX, big upgrade from 10 series. With AMD, 
it's going to be AMD really pushing their brand. Obviously, they've got a lot of loyalists. They're probably going to push the fact that now they've got hardware-based ray tracing. They're going to push that you've got uniformity with uh, consoles. They're probably going to also, I'm almost certain they're going to have some variant of upsampling tech. It's going to be different from NVIDIA's, of course, because they don't have the tentacles. It's probably going to be lower precision operations, maybe some type of really enhanced version of uh, Radeon image sharpening. Really interestingly, when I've been talking to AMD through um, PR representatives and stuff like that, one of the things that they have been really proud of, actually, is RIS, Radeon image sharpening. Um, and it was a really pretty big feature for them with uh, the 5000 series. In some games, it actually looked pretty damn good. Your mileage will vary. One of the benefits of RAS is that the performance penalty is not too big. Obviously, with NVIDIA, because I've been discussing things with them as well, they are super hyped with uh, the new generation of uh, hardware-based ray tracing, the major improvements for that. So kind of talking to some of the vendors too, um, I think everyone's really gearing up for these launches. It's going to be interesting to see what the availability is for all of these as well. Um, but yeah, with all of that said, though, I think that's just about it for this particular video. If you've enjoyed it, you know what to do. Like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I am going to run off um, and do some R9 290X testing, because why not? With that said, thanks very much for watching. And by the way... Actually, just to keep you one more second longer, thanks so much to everyone who is a recent subscriber and all of the support, all of the messages. It is kind of um, weird, actually, how many subs we've got recently. It's kind of uh, humbling, very humbling. I can't, I can't really put it into words. It's just, uh, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, I just want to thank you all for it. Uh, I don't want to get all emotional on camera. But with all of that said, thank you very much, and I'll uh, see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.